What? Go ahead. Whoever you know, start, go ahead. I don't want to hold you up, and okay. And I'm sure. I'm sure other people will be joining in. So, just like last time. All right. Sounds good. Well, anyhow, well, I'll watch for him if I see him. I'll I'll connect him. Right. Bring him over. Okay. Yeah, like uh, Dick said, make sure your microphones are muted. Otherwise, you're going to interrupt the speaker. I'm muting mine right now. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me tonight. And uh, what we'll talk about is the oscilloscopes. And this isn't going to be an in-depth thing on how to use a scope. It's more of the benefits of a scope to the radio amateur and in particular being used in, in a shack. Uh, the video is about 30 minutes long, and I'll be around as long as you guys want for questions and answers afterwards. I've got some examples here of, uh, of how to hook up and uh, different scope stuff. So um you know hold your questions to the end and uh, we'll pick it up from there all right go to the screen share Everybody and welcome to uh, this presentation uh, from the test equipment series on oscilloscopes. So what's in the presentation? Well, it's intended as an introduction to oscilloscopes and some of the uses and the benefits to the amateur radio operator. Not included are specifics on how a scope works nor how to use the instrument for troubleshooting. And what you're going to learn on this presentation is uh, an introduction to scopes and uh, this could take a full college semester if we went into it fully so that's not what we're here about all right what we're going to learn is also the value of what a scope brings to uh, learning electronics and the value it brings into the ham shack uh, we'll show you a lot of different things on this presentation uh, what can be measured uh, the different types of scopes and the features uh, the differences between analog and digital scopes, and we'll have some examples of some waveforms and examples of uh, instruments uh, to make uh, measurements on a scope. We'll also have a little demonstration, if there's time, on uh, measuring capacitance and inductance, and also how to measure the length and impedance of a coaxial cable. So what is a scope? Well, according to uh, Webster's uh, device for viewing oscillations, uh, as electrical voltage or current and displayed on the screen of a cathode ray tube. That's a bit dated. Scopes are a bit more than that these days. So we'll update it to uh, Paul's definition here. A device for viewing the amplitude of electrical signals over a period of time or frequency or magnitude of current on a screen of a cathode ray tube, liquid crystal display, or a computer screen. Uh, what can you measure with a scope? Well, Quite a bit, actually. Of course, voltage, current, impedance, capacitance, inductance, velocity factor, phase angle, resistance, power, uh, carrier modulation, frequency, rise and fall time of various signals. Uh, you can uh, view and decode uh, digital signals. Uh, you can measure pressure transducers and for many applications in the medical industry, such as monitoring blood pressure, EKG, EEG, radiology, and so forth. Uh, so what can you measure with an oscilloscope in the frequency domain? That would be filter characteristics, response curves, SWR bandwidth, deviation, power bandwidth, thief alignment and bandwidth, uh, receiver oscillator alignment if you're aligning a radio. Okay, we can also, see, also use a scope in XY mode, which would give us the ability to measure frequency radio, passive component characteristics. Uh, characteristics of active components, diodes, transistors, and so forth. You can also use, use it as a ready tuning indicator in your shack, and you can measure RF amplifier linearity and modulation. In the scope technologies, the first scope and the oldest scope is the recurrent suite. They're good as a waveform monitor. You can do some XY with them. Uh, they're not calibrated. So it's hard to measure exact voltages and uh, exact frequencies. They're old tech, no longer manufactured, and they are a little difficult to use because you can't sync the waveform easily. So scope technologies continued. We have calibrated and triggered sweep scopes. Of course, they can be used as the waveform monitor. You can still use them in XY mode, but they're calibrated for amplitude and sweep. So you can actually measure 
voltage and you can actually measure uh, time and inversely you can also measure frequency. All current scopes are of this type. Now currently there's tools with triggered sweep for monitors. They do XY modes. They're calibrated for voltage and amplitude so that you can actually measure the voltage accurately. And they're also calibrated for sweep times, so you can get uh, exact uh, delay times and uh, period times on the scope, as well as the inverse of that, the frequency of the signals you're looking at. Uh, all current scopes are of this type, and uh, they all contain trigger circuits, which provide for da stable displays. There's also digital and analog storage or multi-domain scopes. In the analog realm, again, you can use them for waveform monitors. Uh, they use a CRT for display. Continuing on the architecture, there are analog and digital scopes and multi-domain scopes. In the analog realm, uh, you can uh, measure, them, measure your uh, waveforms, of course, and uh, your CRT displays are used. They're best for rapidly changing waveforms, such as uh, monitoring your audio or RF envelopes. Uh, High-end scopes can have cursors and math functions, more about that later. Uh, they're readily available on the used market for very low prices, often free. Uh, new analog scopes are more expensive than entry-level digital scopes. Right, in the digital storage scope category, they can be used as a waveform monitors, but uh, gives you more precision. They're used as an LCD a display instead of a CRT. Uh, you can also display them on your computer. Uh, they're best for digital signals and recurring analog signals. Entry-level uh, scopes have advanced features such as cursors, uh, measurement readouts, and math functions. Uh, Multi-domain scopes also provide a logic analyzer and or spectrum analyzer functions to the scope. So what do you buy, analog or digital? Well, really should think about getting both. With your analog scopes, they're easier to learn. Uh, they're better for monitoring RF envelopes in the shack and other analog signals. And digital scopes bring a phenomenal spectrum of measurement capabilities that are far more complex with a steeper learning curve. Regardless of what technology you go for, get as much bandwidth as you can possibly afford. In scope grades, uh, we generally have uh, two grades, service grade and laboratory grade. The service grade, such as this uh, leader uh, 20 megahertz dual trace scope, it is solid state with the exception of the CRT, uh, makes a good general monitor scope. And uh, again, being triggered and uh, calibrated, you, uh, you have a very good scope that's great for a shack. Uh, size isn't too awful big, but it is a substantial piece of equipment. In the laboratory grade, you have uh, Tektronix and uh, Keysight, LaCroix, uh, and others that are in that laboratory grade, but they're very expensive. Uh, on the screen here, you see the uh, Tektronix 11302A. It's a 500 megahertz analog scope with digital capabilities. It can store its waveforms and it can give you a digital readout uh, with cursors, uh, so it helps with the. They're pretty decent scopes altogether, uh, and, but you really want to try to avoid these if you can. Uh, here's another Heath kit, the IO4510, and this is the kind of scope that you want to get. Between that leader that you saw earlier and the Heath kit, if you're going to get an analog scope, this is about, about the same for. Uh, megahertz, uh, if you're really going to start out, you should be up into 30 to 50 megahertz if you can find them. But they're dirt cheap, sometimes free. This was a $20 uh, find at uh, Hamfest, and I also found the uh, leader at uh, Rietta Ranch. It's a general flea market, and sometimes people show up with interesting stuff and, and was able to pick up that scope for $20. So they're not real expensive uh, with the analog scopes. You'll see them on eBay with high, prices that are way too high. You throw in the shipping on top of it, forget it. I wouldn't buy any recurring sweep off of uh, eBay. Currently, the uh, digital scope realm, you'll find that uh, the Chinese uh, folks have done some pretty tremendous jobs getting the cost of scopes down. Uh, here's a Rigol digital scope. It's a 70, 70 megahertz dual channel. 
Um, I only have one channel displayed here in the yellow line in the center, and you got horizontal uh, cursors for measuring the amplitude and vertical cursors for measuring time, and uh, those results are displayed in the little square you see in the upper left-hand corner of the display. Also, there's lots of USB scopes out there. These plug directly into the USB port of your computer or tablet. And uh, you have software that will display a waveform on the screen. Uh, these are not bad. They're not my first choice for an oscilloscope. But you can get some pretty sophisticated ones. Uh, but this is just one that I have on hand for demo purposes and for teaching. Uh, they're not bad little scopes, but uh, there's nothing like a real uh, separate scope interest, uh, instrument on your desk. And if you want to try out a scope and don't want to spend a whole bunch of money, here's a, a little digital scope, a DSO 138. Get these off of Amazon and eBay for 20 to $30, uh, depending on whether you want the plastic case or not. They come as a kit and with through-hole parts. Uh, there's no SMT soldering to be done. And you put the, put the thing together in a couple of hours, and you got yourself a working digital oscilloscope to learn with. A little bit of a pain to use, but they're not bad. Uh, they only got about 100 kilohertz of bandwidth, but it's a nice device to learn on. And If you like kit building, they're a whole bunch of fun. There are some specialty scopes out there. For example, the Heathkit SB614 station monitor. Uh, these are real handy in the shack. They're re relatively easily priced on eBay, but they are slightly on the expensive side because they're a dedicated instrument. This is a spectrum analyzer from Signalant. You're looking at the RF display of a 1340 kilohertz AM, our local AM station. And there's a ton of functions built into this that uh, older spectrum analyzers don't have. Uh, this particular one with the uh, tracking generator option uh, was 1600 bucks. So you look at that, that's not a real expensive piece of kit, and you'll see later why. And specialty scopes again, uh, what you're looking at is a uh, 7603 mainframe scope from the 70s and 80s from Tektronix. That uh, scope itself, we're talking about the part with the CRT display, was about 3600 bucks. Uh, so they're, they're, the mainframe is what you got, and then you had to put plugins in it to make it do what you want. In this particular case, it's a 16-channel uh, logic analyzer. It would actually display 16 different waveforms on that screen. Continuing on, the 7633 on the left, that's an analog storage scope. Uh, it actually stores the uh, waveform on the screen, and you would use a camera to take a picture of it. That mainframe was about $4,600. Uh, in there is a uh, dual-channel vertical amplifier, the module on the left. The center module is a differential amplifier, and then, of course, you got your horizontal control module on the right. On the right-hand scope, another 7603, there's a... Uh, 7L14 spectrum analyzer plug-in, and uh, these things were pretty expensive. The plug-in in 1975 was $18,000, so as you can see, that would be quite an expensive oscilloscope. Uh, other types of instruments uh, that fall into specialty is a curve tracer. This is a Tektronix 576, and it's designed to display the characteristics of components, particularly uh, transistors and other solid state components. Back in 75, it was 20 grand. That's 100 grand today. So they're very expensive uh, instruments for sure. Right, and that would be a display on the 576 of a family of curves for a transistor. The nice thing about the curve tracer, the transistor curve tracer, is that it tests the transistor under real operating conditions, not low voltage like an analog meter model would do. Uh, back in the days of uh, home uh, home electronics service shops in your neighborhood, your mom and pop TV store, uh, they couldn't afford the twenty thousand dollars for a Tektronix curve tracer, but they could afford two ninety five or about fifteen hundred dollars in these days for an add on. That's a, a liter scope with a, a liter curve tracer outside unit. Hook it up to the horizontal and vertical inputs of the scope and display the curves. You can see on this one there's only six curves that it displays. 
whereas on the Tektronics it was 10. So these weren't nearly as comprehensive, but look at the price difference for sure. All right, other specialty co uh, scopes are uh, component curve tracers, and this particular one is a Huntron. And play capacitors, inductors, and uh, solid state devices, but you can only do two terminals, so you would have to display the response of a terminal from uh, emitter to base, for example, and base to collector uh, on the screen with a separate measurement, and then, and then you could test your transistor that way. So they're, uh, they were interesting instruments, but they were still rather expensive. Right? For example, you could get a Heath kit. Uh, for about uh, 250 bucks, that would be $2,500 in, in terms these days. That previous Keith cut that we saw, the dual trace trigger debt, was almost $600. Multiply that by five, and it was still a $3,000 scope. So you can see that these days the price of equipment has gone down dramatically. The real sad thing about uh, the Huntron and that Heath kit uh, curve tracer is that they were stripped down oscilloscopes with uh, just a power supply in it to do the measuring. So you could uh, actually use your regular plain Jane oscilloscope with this circuit and do exactly what the Huntron and the Heath kit did. Uh, so uh, why they're still commanding such huge, huge prices on eBay is beyond me. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, here you go. This is all you need to make, uh, make a, a curve tracer out of your regular oscilloscope. In order to use an oscilloscope, you have to have some sort of input signal from someplace, either through your circuit that you're working on, say an audio circuit that you're tracing out, or perhaps a uh, RF envelope out of your transmitter, what have you. But if you're working with uh, components or testing components or non-powered circuits, you have to have some sort of uh, signal coming in. And for that, you can use an uh, AF generator or RF generator, DC power supply, a pulse generator, uh, a transformer, or other type of uh, source so that you can get your, uh, uh, your signal into your uh, components. So here we have some examples of signal sources. At the top is a function generator uh, that'll do sine, square, triangle, waves, up to 2 megahertz. Uh, handy little instrument, but it's kind of on the old tech side. Uh, this one I got at the um, Nearfest for 20 bucks. Uh, in the center is a fast edge pulse generator kit, and uh, uh, Alan, W2AEW, uh, uses that to test his stuff. And you'll learn more about Alan in the, in the uh, presentation here as well. At the bottom is an arbitrary function generator, which is the uh, digital modern equivalent to the function generator at the top. And uh, that can uh, produce a wide variety of waveforms. And uh, you can even capture waveforms on your oscilloscope, export them to this device, and this device will reproduce those waveforms for further testing and analysis. So a uh, great piece of kit to have, but they are a little on the expensive side. Uh, this one was just under $300 for a 25 megahertz uh, generator. So how do you measure components like capacitors, inductors, and others? Well, there's some really great videos on YouTube on how to do all that stuff, but about the best out there is Alan, W2AEW. Uh, he's the uh, tech specialist, as a matter of fact, tech specialist coordinator down in uh, southern New Jersey. And Alan is the scope guru of all time, my hero. Uh, his ability to uh, work a scope and do magic with him is, is beyond belief. You really need to look him up on YouTube if you're interested in the solar scopes. It's, uh, you know, he's great lessons. So look for number 90 on his uh, list of uh, YouTube videos on how to measure capacitors and inductors. Uh, we can also measure uh, coax, and Alan has a video up on that, number 37, using that pulse generator we saw earlier. And a little bit of math, you can actually determine how long a piece of coax is, and very, very accurately, depending on your oscilloscope. If your oscilloscope is accurate, then your measurements will become accurate. This comes in really handy if you're trying to create uh, phasing <laughs> harnesses and so forth. Uh, you know, it's a great, great, great tool to have. So about scopes in the shack, I mean, that's why we're all here, is what can, uh, what can we benefit or how can we benefit from scopes in the shack? Uh, well, first off, uh, uh, current or recurrent sweep or trigger sweep scopes are okay, but the analog scopes are the best. Right? So whether you get a, a recurrent or triggered sweep, analog scope is the one that you want to start with for the shack. 
All right, and what you can use it for is to monitor your on-air signal for proper modulation, uh, uh, verify the accuracy of your watt meter. Uh, you can test your, uh, or it's best for your tuning indicator for your uh, ready signal. Uh, that's receiving signals, that is. Uh, you can monitor the linearity of your amplifier and uh, other digital uses such as the FFT, uh, Fast Fourier Transform Math Function, which will turn your plain Jane digital storage oscilloscope into a rudimentary spectrum analyzer. So if you suspect that a good portion of your energy is getting out in harmonics, you'd actually be able to use your oscilloscope to see that by using the FFT function. And uh, Fast Fourier Transform is only one of the many mathematical functions that most scopes can perform. The SB614 is installed in my shack, so we've got some examples here of what to look for. Right, here's good modulation. You can see that uh, the tops of the waveforms at the peaks are, are rounded. They're not cut off, so I've got good modulation here, good clear signal. Over modulating, you start to uh, outpace what your power supply I can uh, transmit. You'll notice that on the peaks of those signals, they're all squared off at the top. That introduces an awful lot of extra bandwidth to your signal. It introduces a lot of interference on the band. And so having this uh, scope in your shack uh, is a really good idea. Your ALC meter is okay, but this is the real McCoy. This is really looking at your transmitted signal, and uh, you can see uh, just how clear it is. You can't hear your signal because you're transmitting, obviously. Others can hear it, and they can comment on it. But being able to see your signal as you're transmitting gives you a real good idea of just how good you sound. All right, the other function of this particular device is to uh, measure the linearity of your signal. What happens here is that uh, on the X mode, or the vertical mode of the, of the scope, you have your uh, amplifier output that's giving you the vertical signal. The horizontal signal, uh, making it go from left to right, is actually your input. In other words, your transmitters, your transceiver's output goes in and makes the scope go horizontally. And if you get a nice trapezoid like this with nice flat edges, then you know you've got linearity. And if the signal goes out to a nice sharp point, you've got 100% modulation as well. So uh, this is very, very important if you've got an amplifier in a shack and a very good way to, to make sure that you're able to uh, get a nice clean signal out. Here we're a little under modulated and you can see the point of the uh, trapezoid is cut off. So we're under modulated here. And here's where we start to get into real trouble. We've got too much modulation, too much drive, and we're starting to go nonlinear. Uh, you can see the edges of the trapezoid uh, are starting to bulge out. And that front point, even though it's going out fully, the whole envelope is starting to shorten up on you. Uh, so this is, uh, this is nonlinear, overmodulated, and it's very easy to see on the scope and you can see what's happening. The only other way to see what's actually going on is to look at your spectrum on a spectrum, uh, spectrum analyzer, uh, but that's a whole different level of expense for your shack. These things are great little monitors. The, every ham manufacturer makes one, Kenwood Yezu ICOM, uh, and of course these Heath kits, and these Heath kits are very plentiful out there. They're usually in the $100 range or so if you can find them. So I hopefully I've convinced you that having a scope in a shack is important. But if you're new to scopes, and you're best off getting an analog to learn on. You can still get them out there. Uh, they're not real expensive. Often you can get them for free and get as much bandwidth as you can afford. If you're purchasing an analog scope, make sure that it's working. Get a dual trace. Get triggered sweep. Make sure it's solid state. But of course the CRT isn't, but that's okay. Right. Get as much bandwidth as you can get for your budget. Uh, you want to be in the 25 to 30 megahertz minimum, but if you can get a 50 megahertz or greater, that's even better. Right. As the functionality will increase at those 50 megahertz scopes and up. Uh, if, most of all, though, get, uh, get some guidance from your Elmer on purchasing a scope. 
Uh, if you're going out to a ham fest, which is not a bad place to buy them, up at Nera Fest, you'll often see them uh, on tables operating for, so that the seller lets you know that it's an operating scope. Um, you know, the service grade scopes are, are just fine. Uh, you get into the high-end scopes like the Tex and the Agilents and HPs and so forth. Uh, if you get a problem with those, they're kind of a pain to uh, uh, to fix and get running again, uh, as opposed to something like a Heath kit that uses standardized parts. They're easy to keep going. All right, if you're going to get into the digital realm, uh, remember you've got a much steeper learning curve to get there, but the scopes are pretty inexpensive. You get a new scope in a $250 class, and we'll have a couple examples here short, shortly. Right. They're great when you're designing and experimenting, especially in the digital realm. They bring a tremendous amount of functionality that even the most advanced lab-grade scopes of the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s couldn't approach. The most impressive function is the math. Right. You see the formula up in the right-hand corner? W equals V squared divided by 50 ohms. You can actually use your oscilloscope your digital oscilloscope to measure the voltage that's coming out of your transmitter and then doing some mathematical work. You put this formula right into the scope and a second waveform will appear on your screen and that waveform will be actually calibrated in the watts that you're putting out. So it's a uh, it's a really cool way of, uh, of monitoring your output in that on that digital scope. Uh, the um, the other things that you can do, for example, uh, displaying voltage and current on two different waveforms and then have a third waveform that tells you what the resistance is of the circuit. Uh, so it's really interesting what you can do with the digital scopes these days. They're really, really powerful. All right. uh, brand names are always safe, but the Asian producers are quite capable. Uh, probably two of the best Asian are Siglent and Rigol. Uh, and Lee prices. They're Owan. They're usually the bargain basement brand. Not bad stuff, but you're starting to get into uh, construction quality issues, that kind of thing with the lower price scopes. But remember, get as much bandwidth as you can afford. Here's an example of a Tektronix scope. The Tektronix is, uh, you know, laboratory grade. This is 60 megahertz, and it's about 1300 bucks. Uh, specs aren't, aren't too bad, but they're not calling out how many waveforms per second that it will do. Conversely, uh, the uh, Rigol scopes are really, really good scopes. Uh, this is a 50 megahertz. It's about uh, $350, but it's four channels, just like the tech. Uh, it's a little bit less in bandwidth, uh, but a very capable scope. And uh, I'm sure you'd uh, be proud to own this guy. Uh, they do work really nice. But that's not all. The 1104 from Rigol is 100 megahertz bandwidth, four channels, plus 16 channels of uh, digital. Uh, so you can uh, do that uh, logic waveform analysis. Right? And it's about 500 bucks. And if you want to throw in a two channel 25 megahertz arbitrary function generators like the one you saw, uh, that 499 becomes 639. So you get two instruments for $639. I mean, there's quite a bit of stuff that you're getting in that package for real short money. Uh, Want to learn more? Paul Danzer, K1II, puts out a really nice uh, oscilloscope book from the ARRL. Uh, you can uh, certainly get a hold of that. Some of my favorite YouTubers, as we mentioned, was Alan Wolke, W2AEW. And uh, you've got Mr. Carlson's lab, VE7. ZWZ. Paul Carlson's got a really, really great YouTube channel all about techie stuff. Not a lot on the ham radio front, a few items up there, but it's mostly about uh, refurbishing uh, old equipment and test equipment use and how to use them. Great YouTube channel. Finally, one of the most prolific electrical engineering uh, uh, channels out there is the EEV blog from David L. Jones. Unfortunately, Dave's not a ham radio operator, but that's okay. We can forgive him for that. He's just a crazy Aussie who does really, really great videos 
on all kinds of test equipment, not just scopes. There's a bunch more out there, too, but uh, watch YouTube and uh, learn a little bit. If you haven't gotten a scope yet, do a little bit of research here, and I think uh, it'll go a long, long way for you to uh, get the scope that you really need and spend money only once. All right, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A session, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. So in the meantime, before... Thank you very much for watching the presentation. I certainly hope uh, that you've learned something new and uh, we'll be around for the uh, Q&A. Uh, you can get me uh, with this information here. Uh, I'm good at uh, awrl.net, so w1scx at awrl.net, and I've also got my bio up on qrz.com. Just look me up there. There's a bunch of really good information on test equipment and other ham radio adventures. So thank you very much for uh, viewing the presentation, and uh, let's go to your questions. All right, get the microphone back here. Can everybody hear me okay? Nod? Yep, yep, yep. Great, great. All right. Yeah, you're fine. We'll get rid of Louie, the other Heath Kitty here. And a couple of, couple of notes. Uh, on those uh, links that were called out in the video, if you go to my QRZ bio, you can find those links at the bottom. Uh, so you can get to that stuff easily enough. Right. And the other thing was I mentioned a couple of times in there about NearFest. That's the New England Amateur Radio Festival. That's the biggest ham fest in the, in the Northeast, uh, at least as far as New England is concerned. We get a lot of hams from all over, including New York. And uh, it's really a great. They have it uh, the first weekend of May, usually. And then uh, also on the... Uh, uh, in October, so it's a twice a year deal, and I know everybody's out there is really missing the ham fest. So the first one they have once this COVID thing starts to clear is going to be a good one. Uh, the uh, spring one is usually much better attended than the fall, but it's a great ham fest. Uh, it may be a bit of a ways from Western New York, but uh, you're looking at about an eight hour drive, and uh, there's plenty of accommodations around there if you're looking for a real good ham fest to go to. All right, a couple items before we get to the questions. Um, these, uh, these, is, these uh, PC scopes, uh, they're not bad, but they certainly wouldn't be my first choice because they're just, uh, you know, you've got a, a front end, you've got an ADD converter sending data out to your uh, computer, and then it's got to do the processing in the computer. So there's usually a lag and delay. Uh, and anytime you get into the uh, into the digital scopes, they just don't work as well as an analog scope when uh, displaying fast changing analog signals like uh, audio and RF. Uh, but they're good; they're not bad. And uh, I use them for uh, when I go on the road or if I'm teaching because I can get up on the screen and display on the uh, projector a uh, you know oscilloscope trace. So it's great for teaching. Uh, uh, if you these guys, uh, these little uh, little digital scopes on the uh, on Amazon for uh, pretty dirt cheap money, and uh, let me see the display come up there eventually. There we go. A little bit. And there you go. Just got a a neat little square wave in there. And, you know, it, 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 does, it does the business up to about 100 kilohertz, and it's great to learn with. And it doesn't have much as far as storage is concerned, but it'll save, uh, uh, save a trace so that you can do some analysis on it. And it's a great way to learn, uh, learn scopes, uh, you know, very basic stuff for sure. All right. Uh, next thing that usually comes up, how do I get... Um, my RF envelope onto a scope so I can see it. And uh, with every scope, you've got to have a probe. This is a 10X probe that plugs into the scope and will give you a, uh, in this particular case, a straight through or a 10 times attenuation to protect the input of the scope and allow uh, measuring of higher frequencies. But the quickest and easiest way to get something out of your scope or out of your uh, RF is just take a pair of clip leads and wind it around the outside of the coax 
and hook it to the probe. And uh, the scope will be sensitive enough to uh, uh, pick it up. Of course, if you're using something crazy like Hardline, uh, not so much, but uh, you know, any uh, RGA coax or anything like that, you'd be able to get enough to see a, see a trace on your screen. Uh, if you're looking for something a little more, uh, there are samplers. Uh, this particular device it will fit in line with the coax. And it's uh, just coax in, coax out. And uh, there's a sampler section. And all it is is just a little loop on the bottom that goes past the conductor, the center conductor inside here. And then you can adjust how much signal you want by pulling out and or rotating uh, the input device and you can lock it down and it gives you a reliable trace uh, for a sample. Um, these things are expensive, uh, but I found this one at a flea market for just a couple of bucks. Otherwise, if you take a standard uh, UHF T connector, all right, you can remove the center pin of the uh, T connector, grind it down a little bit, put it back in so that it doesn't actually make contact with a PL259 or an SO239, send it off to your scope, and uh, you've got a, uh, a nice sampler that's not going to overload the input of the scope. Well, I mentioned a moment ago about the 10 to 1 probe, but uh, getting that into your, uh, into your coax is rather difficult. So what I did was I built a sampler that is a, uh, out of an old Tektronix uh, 50 ohm terminator. And uh, you see the little hole in there to adjust the capacitor, just like you'd adjust the capacitor to compensate your, your probe. And it's a real, a real simple circuit to make that. And hopefully, just real simple. You can get this in the ARRL handbook. Uh, or off of uh, Paul Danzer's book, you've got this circuit in there to build a probe. And by the way, this is uh, this is Paul's book from from the league. Uh, not a bad book at all. Uh, it is uh, very introductory, so uh, quite appropriate for uh, for beginners, especially. All right. Uh, if you want to get that trapezoid uh, picture, you know, if you have just a scope and you don't have a station monitor. Uh, basically, you're looking at, at something like this. This is a quick block diagram. Hopefully, you can see that. And you've got your, uh, your transceiver going to your amplifier and then off to your antenna tuner. And all you're doing is putting your scope in XY mode and then uh, taking the RF out of your transmitter uh, putting it through a detector diode circuit into the scope to give you that horizontal uh, deflection. And then you're taking your RF sample directly off of your amplifier to give it the vertical sample, and you can get your trapezoid that way. So that's all that the, those monitors are doing. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, you know, I know all the new scopes or the new radios today have the built in monitors, but if you're doing anything classic or anything with an older radio, very good thing to have, particularly if you've got a uh, an amplifier involved. The other thing you, that you can do, if scopes don't have a resistance range like a multimeter, they don't have a current range like a multimeter. So measuring current with your scope is a little more involved. Uh, this is a, a hand tech uh, clamp on current probe. This does measure AC and DC. Uh, we'll plug directly into your scope and you can read current directly. Um, they say uh, with uh, inductors and capacitors that your current is out of phase with your voltage. And uh, no one's ever shown me that until I got this device. And it, it really you really do see that, uh, that phase angle shift. For sure. So, oh, oh, also, by the way, if you want to do current, if you put a one ohm resistor in the series with your circuit and measure the voltage drop with your scope, you're actually measuring the current. Uh, questions, comments, anybody? I'll give a comment if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. 
So I've been out of the hobby for some 20 years, but involved in amateur TV. And one of the things that I left and never completed was a line sampler. It uses a 6AL5 for some reason. That seems to be an ideal tube. And I assume what happens is one side gets connected to the feed line, and then the other side gets connected to a scope. So one of these days I'm gonna to try to use that with one of my scopes that I have. I have 100 megahertz old Tektronics laying around. I don't know if you can see it clear. Yeah. But it's uh, enticing me to do that because uh, there must have been some reason why I built this thing. <laughs> and that was for uh, analog NTSC uh, amateur TV. Okay, is anybody doing NTSC nowadays? I haven't found anybody and why would you with Zoom these days, right? <laughs> Although I am experimenting around with uh, um, with ATSC one, which uh, I have a small modulator, and it's interesting because typically when you guys see waveforms, you know you got your typical uh, mountain, so to speak, that you see. But the interesting waveform that you have with ATSC one uh, uh, is that when you look at it, it looks like a square wave. And part of it is, is that a ATSC signal is made up of many, many sine waves. So you actually get what looks like over the air a square wave if you, uh, if you were to look at it with a scope. Uh, or I should say, excuse me, not a scope, a spectrum analyzer. And there are some kits out there that allow you to convert your uh, uh, scope into a spectrum analyzer, not a high grade quality, but there are some, uh, there was one in Long Island, uh, science something that made a kit that could allow you to put in uh, this box. It goes in between your X and Y or whatever the case is. And it would convert your scope into uh, uh, a small spectrum analyzer with a front end. Yeah, I've seen some projects out of QST do it, that do the same thing. So. Uh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, but again, if uh, if you get to get the new modern scopes, uh, you go to that uh, fast Fourier transform function, and that that second uh, trace comes right up, and you've got a uh, a real spectrum analyzer. Is it as accurate as as a real one? Uh, no, not so much. Does it have all the controllability of a real spectrum analyzer? Not so much. But for everything an amateur radio operator is doing, pretty much uh, gives you what you need. Uh, at least you, you know, get a real a real good fix on what your harmonics are doing and uh, your bandwidth as well. Yeah. Do you recall uh, in the old days that they would have uh, information on how to convert a TV set into an oscilloscope? I've, I've, I've heard of that. I've never seen it done. Uh, okay. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a product that's been around for a long time, so to speak, in, uh, in the world of Hamden. Yeah, I've, um, I've often wanted to do that because I had lots of TVs to play with, but could never have anything like an oscilloscope until, uh, uh, well, I, I, shouldn't even, I shouldn't even complain because I think I was only 14 or 15 years old before I got my first scope. And that uh, almost instantly turned into a second one. And next thing you know, a family friend had uh, uh, left me a whole bunch of test gear and I had a, a complete Heathkit lab with a bunch of other stuff in it besides. So uh, those were the teenage years. That stuff was all long gone, but. Uh, My first scope was a Nyko 460. <laughs> yeah, I think I had one of those and I think I had the IO5 was my Heathkit scope. And one of the things with older scopes that tend, when they tend to go bad is, is that, and then it doesn't pay to fix them if you can't get the part. And that's the power transformer. If they start to arc internally, boy, that will louse up the, the picture, so to speak. Yeah, that'll 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 do it in a hurry. And uh, matter of fact, I had to throw one out here a while back. It, and you know, the power the the uh, the power transformer was gone, and there was just no way I was going to get another one. And the CRT, I didn't, I don't even know what it was. Uh, but you know, it was it, at some point you got to say, okay, no, I'm not going to do this one. And off it went to the recycling. Anybody else questions, comments? 
Okay, quick question. Um, you know, especially with the portable, um, can you put like a small antenna on there or a small lead and take it portable to hunt down? Uh, uh, is, is, you know, is it sensitive enough to do that? A hunt down what? RF noises, you know, like from wall warts and et cetera. Uh, yeah, that you could you could do that, and especially if you can isolate uh, the particular frequency that you're looking for, you could make it to uh, a parallel circuit and be able to adjust that to sniff out just what you're looking for. And you know, it's all a proximity thing. Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't do you much good without. Uh, you know, without a loop antenna or something like that to at least get bi-directionality out of it. But yeah, you certainly could. It certainly would work. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Anybody else? I'd like to ask a question, Paul. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, I have a on loan from a local group. I have a, an HP spectrum analyzer that's is a, a pretty nice one, uh, but is vastly over my head. Um, and I've been looking at the, the Siglent um, the digital oscilloscopes. Yep, the, 30, curious, the 3021. Uh, the SDS uh, 1202. Um, STS 1202? SDS 1202. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one. I've got a 3021 sitting on my bench here. Okay, so this one is a is a 200 megahertz bandwidth and is two channels. And I'm just curious. Oh, we're we're, ta we're talking oscilloscope. Uh, two channels, or we're talking scope, not uh, spectrum analyzer. Correct. 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 Okay. Yeah, no, the Siglet stuff is good. Uh, the Rigol stuff is good. If I if you're going Asian, those would be my top two choices. I'd okay. love to get into the Tektronic stuff, but you know, it's just it, 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 you know, twelve hundred dollars for that scope example versus you know three hundred and fifty bucks. Right. Yeah. You know, I like the. Uh, I think the about the best bargain out there is the uh, Rigol uh, okay. ten fifty four Z. Um, and if you want to take that to 100 megahertz, then uh, the uh, 1154, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, 1104, 1154, 1104, yeah, 1104Z uh, scope is four channels. The only thing that it lacks is a trigger input. However, you can use one of the channels as the trigger. And uh, it work it works fine. So you 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 know we may lose it for analysis, but at least you can use it to trigger on the signals that you're looking for. So it's a it's a great scope. Uh, the Siglet stuff is is just about as nice. But I think the uh, I think the 1054Z family is, okay. is is would be a better choice. That's what I would spend my money on. But as far as okay. a, spec, a spectrum analyzer, I really like the Siglet. Uh, 30, uh, 21. Uh, I was going to buy the Rigol, uh, but once I saw the specs and saw in particular Dave Jones's review, I says, okay, it's going to be the Siglent for me. And you talk about a nice machine that gets the job done. It does it. Uh, we just did the duplexers on our UHF repeater over the weekend with it. So, uh, it, I mean, it's got everything that the ham needs and then some. And do you think getting something with two channels is going to be quickly disappointing? And I wish I'd gotten something with four or. Um, I, my 2000 series Rigol uh, has a lot of features that the 1000 doesn't. Most of them I don't need. A few of them I thought was worth going for the 2000. And I settled for a two channel instead of the four. Uh, right. But thinking back, you know, a four channel scope would be great. Uh, at least something that I can get up and go. That big Tektronics you saw in the in the uh, presentation, that's sitting on the bench. That's 500 megahertz, and um, I can get up to eight channels on that. I've only got two plugins, so I get four four channels total. Uh, but yeah. I'll tell you that uh, that thing is a beast, and it's 40 pounds of scope, and it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. 
Gotcha. So uh, four yeah, channel I'm in, is great. I'm in Portland, Oregon, which is pretty close to, to Beaverton. And occasionally Tektronix does have a garage sale. Really? But you kind of have to be in the know of when that happens and and be, be there at the right time. So I think me getting something of that ilk is probably out of my price range a bit. Have you been to the Vintage Tech Museum? No. Oh, yes. Go look them up on YouTube. If they're okay. right down the street, I'd be going there tomorrow. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll check that out. Well, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was fantastic. Sure. I'm glad to do it and glad to be here. And, uh, yeah, go check out that museum. And it's all run by volunteers, uh, you know, all all uh, former and, and even some current uh, tech employees. So you definitely got to check that out because there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Can I offer a suggestion? Sure, go ahead. So one of the things that I tend to do is years ago, um, there were still a lot of tool products out there and things of that nature. And some of it was transformless. Now with the solid state stuff, uh, it looks like we always work from an isolated secondary, but not necessarily because now we use switching power supplies. One of the things for troubleshooting that I strongly recommend, and I do this when I use my oscilloscope, is definitely have a isolation transformer. And another thing to have is a load lamp, very simple to build. All you need to do is have a socket, get some good old incandescent bulbs up to us still around. And end up with something that's hot and cause them further damage on any of your equipment, including the scope. <laughs> Yeah, Dave, Dave Jones does a complete uh, video on just how dangerous that can be um, on the um, on the older uh, older uh, what they call the American All American Five <laughs> transformerless radios. One half of that chassis uh, is is direct to the uh, to the power supply to the wall outlet. So if you have that plug plugged in bass backwards, and you go to hook up your scope ground probe. Uh, ground on for your probe to that mm -hmm. chassis, uh, you'll instantly uh, be very well amazed as to what happens and uh, how much smoke you can make and probably uh, severely damage, if not totally, your scope. So uh, I, I totally agree. I've got a B&K 1655 uh, AC power supply, which is, of course, a variac and an isolation transformer. And it's got a nice meter on it for monitoring the current. And the, what they call the dim bulb, which is what you were describing, is a great way to uh, regulate current. If you're working on any of this old stuff and it hasn't been plugged in for a while, you definitely want to bring it up slowly and watch current draw. I mean, if you plug this thing in and uh, this 25 watt light bulb is in series and it comes on full brightness, you know that there's a serious problem inside whatever it is you're working on. So I totally agree. Uh, and uh, keep an isolation transformer, uh, plug, anything you're working on, anything, whether it's transformer operated or otherwise, I'll still plug into the isolation transformer or the isolation supply. And uh, of course, when it's got an ammeter on it, you bring up the voltage slowly and uh, you prevent damage and possibly hurting yourself as well. Anything else, anybody? I got nothing. Thank, Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, guys.